Okay, let's be all serious about it. Yeah, Okay, so last, we're going to continue with uh, linear approximation. And we're going to talk about, as I gave you in the handout, marginal functions and what they're for. So we're still on that. Uh, so we're going to recall the linear approximation formula. Recall the linear approximation formula. What's the formula? F of A plus the derivative of F of A times X minus X. This is the linear approximation formula. When is it best? How, what are the conditions under which we can use this? Um, X close. Right, X is close to A. Right, so this is really isn't a long-range strategy for approximation. Like, if your points are far between each other, this is probably not the best way to go about guessing what that second point is. But when your points are sort of relatively close, um, you can use this. And, of course, we're assuming that f is differentiable and all that. So we can find a derivative. So we can find a derivative, and we have two points that are close together. I can use my knowledge of one point to sort of figure out what the other point is doing without using the function itself, because the function itself might be complicated, but a straight line is always very simple. Um, you might also notice that this is just the formula for a tangent line. So if you look at y equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, you'll realize that that's just the, um, the point slope form. This is just a line through a comma f of a with slope f prime of a, right? So if you plug in m here, that's your x minus x1. This is your y minus y1. So it's really just a tangent line. So we can use the tangent line to approximate what a function is doing. So that's a very nice use of a tangent line. And it works best when the two points are close together, because a tangent line is really something that locally works, right? So if you have some random situation, out far away, the tangent line and the function can be very far far away from each other, giving very different values. But the more you zoom in, the closer they get. So the closer you are to the point of interest is the better the tangent line approximation. Okay, so that was the idea. And I kind of illustrated the fact that we could use a tangent line to guess the, the number for so, the value of a function with the square root example. So we actually did by hand the square root of 3.99, and we're actually correct to like four decimal places, which by doing calculations in our head, which was pretty impressive. Um, there are other approximation methods out there. I don't want to give the, uh, the impression that this is the end all be all, like everyone who's approximating out there is using Calc 1. That's not true. <laughs> the world is a lot more complicated, but this gives you one scenario. And a lot of models that we have are sort of based on this idea, but we sort of extend it to cover more situations using probability and statistics, and a lot of, there are a lot of areas of math that would come together to, to really look at the models that people are doing today. Um, so if you're interested in, um, I don't know if some of you might be interested in swapping into business, but Calc 1 directly isn't going to help you with business, but if you want to be one of those people who are actually creating models to, to map out a situation, um, you're not just the kind of, <coughs> person, the, the business person that smooshes clients doesn't need to know Calc 1. But if you're the kind of person who you have a company and you have all this data and you want to actually make use of it, knowing calculus, probability, and statistics will actually be very useful for you. Okay, so this was, um, we actually did this example where we actually used this to do something and it was pretty close. And that was because the we used the number 3.9 and the nice number was 4 and they were pretty close together. 3.99 and 4 are pretty close together, so our, our, our function actually gave us a really close answer. Um, I want to do one more example like that because it is a kind of problem that I will ask you about. So I'll, I'll give you some sort of uh, expression and I say approximate this expression using linear approximation. And I, I want you to be able to do that. So let's just do another example. 
and then we'll go into market analysis. And I kind of want you guys to lead me through this one. So, approximate. cube root of 8.01 using linear approximation. Okay, so let's see how close we can get to that actual answer. Oh, coming in? What x? Where? Not a, no, not really. No. But that's not how I would set it up. You could set it up that way, but I think that would be harder. Um, by the way, uh, I can tell you ahead of time what the actual answer is, or maybe we can compare it later. But the actual answer, if you plug this into your calculator, I believe it's, it's actually 2.000832. Three two nine six eight six. So that that will be the actual answer. Let's see how close we get to that number. Okay. So uh, tell me what's the first step that you would do in such a problem. So you want to approximate this value. What are you going to do? Set f of x equal to root of x. All right. So you uh, define a function. Define an appropriate function. Really, the, the kind of expression I give you is going to be a real clue. So if I ask you to approximate the cube root of something, the cube root of x would be a nice thing. If I ask you to approximate the ln of something, ln of x would be a nice thing, and so on. And so you can kind of use how the number looks as, as a, a, a clue as to what the best function would be. In this case, I want to approximate a cube root. So probably the cube root function is going to be the best function to use here. So I'm going to take that to be my function. Yeah. Second thing you're going to want to do? Uh, yeah. uh, x is equal to 8.01. Yeah, uh, so we're, we want to figure out the pieces in that formula. So we need to know our x value, our a value. We also need to know the derivative. Um, so eventually I'll take my x and my a, but probably since we already have the function, the next thing I would do is just easier to just find the derivative right away. So let's do that first. Find the prime of x right away. Right, so first, define an appropriate function. Next thing you want to do is find the derivative of that function. One third x to the negative two thirds. Right. So this guy, you will realize this is x to the one third. So you just use the power rule. One third x to the minus two thirds. In other words, you can think of this as one over three times the cube root of x squared. That's but either either one is fine. This will it'll be a little easier to do it by hand if you're doing it looking so at it that way. That little two's in, in the cube root? No, we're using flower power, so the bottom is the root, which that means the cube root, the top is the power, which is squared. Um, okay, so the third thing I would do is um, define your x and your a. So now remember, the x is the actual value that you want to find, but your a is the nice value that's super close to that x value that you already know all the information for. So here, your x would be equal to? 8.01. The 8.01. That's the, the, that's the guy I don't really know about. But my a is something close to that that I do know the cube root of. 8. eight. Just 8. All right, so that's super close. There are a lot of other numbers that I know the cube root of, but I want to choose the closest one because this <laughs> approximation really works when the numbers are close together. And so now, four, plug into that formula. Plug into formula. Oh, I have a question. Yes. I'm a bit confused with how you jump from two to three. Or like. Huh? I'm confused with <coughs> how you jump from two to three or the relation between like both of them. Well, these aren't connected. Like, I don't figure out something from this to get okay. there. They're not connected. Okay. This is just me finding the peak. So one and two are connected, because finding my function allows me to find its derivative. Okay. But this is a separate thing. It's not connected. What, what, you're, what we're really doing is finding the pieces that I would need for the formula. Okay. 
So I know ahead of time the formula is f of x is approximately equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. So in the formula, I need to know about the function. I need to know about its derivative. I also need to know about the x value and the a value. Okay. So 1 and 2 helps me to figure out what these guys are doing. And then part 3 is to let me know what numbers I want to plug in. So technically, they're not connected. I'm just finding pieces to this formula. So this is a formula that you will have to have memorized, but it is just a tangent line formula, so that might help you a little bit. Um, but yeah, you go through this process, and so now let's plug it in. So now our cube root of 8.01, that's actually going to be equal to f of 8.01, that's like the f of x, but that's approximately equal to, and I'm going to plug in this side. So my a is what? 8. eight. So it's just going to be f of 8 plus f prime of 8 times 8.01 minus 8. And we have all the information here, so what is f of 8? Well, you go to f and you plug in 8. 2, 2. So that's going to be 2 plus f one prime six. of 8. 0.08. Uh, let's get a little bit nicer answer here. One if I plug in 8 here, the cube root of 8 is 2, square that, you get 4, so it's 3 times 4, 1 12. But I guess if you're using your calculator, you can plug that in as well, but that would be times 0 0.01. Or that's 1 over 100, so you can think of this as 2 plus 1 over 1200. So that would be my approximation. It's going to be 2 plus a little bit, like 1 over 1200. So that's, that's equal to, say, 2409, uh, 2400, 2401, over 12. Which, I mean, at any point here, you could have plugged it into your calculator, but uh, what is that now plugged into your calculator? 2.00083. You have more? That's all. Well, I like broke it up differently. Well, I think the 3s actually repeat after that. Forever. So we were actually good up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 decimal places with rounding. So the actual answer had a 2 and a 9 here, so if I rounded, I would have gotten that. <laughs> so it's pretty good. So we're close up to six decimal places. <laughs> now this for some context where your your F is measuring some amount of money, this is more than adequate, right? You would because you only need two decimal places. So there are contexts in which that's good enough. I don't need to know what the actual answer is. I can look at this approximation and it'll be fine. By the way, I, did I tell you guys about that bank heist that stole the last two digits? No. So it turns out, like, forever, banks used to, I don't know if they still have this practice, but even though, like, your bank statement gives you uh, the figures in regular currency, you know, whatever dollars and cents you have, banks actually calculated the money in accounts of four decimal places. They just hide the last two decimal places from the customer. Right? So they're doing all their calculations with all the numbers in four decimal places. And so what some hackers did was they hacked into the banking system. This happened a few years ago, I think. And they stole the last two decimal places. And literally no one knew because the, all the statements were in two decimal places whenever you you're, have a human interface. So it took a while for them to figure out that that actually happened. And I don't even actually know if the guys were caught. But that was very clever. <laughs> so, that's why sometimes having too many decimal places can be a disadvantage. So sometimes approximations are nice. Did they catch it? Oh no, I just said that's what I want to do. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Alright. You just hack into a bank. It takes a lot more than knowing this. <laughs> <laughs> to learn how to hack. 
I'm gonna have to edit this video and like <laughs> yeah. voiceover. You know when they got gargle your voice so you can't identify the person. Yeah. <laughs> we got you. <laughs> yeah, ten years. Yeah, that's what I want to do when I grow up. Go back. <laughs> Forget this whole hard work. Get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, yeah. <laughs> 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 so that's sort of um, one use of a derivative. You can use a tangent line to approximate values of functions. And of course the idea behind that is that sometimes dealing with the function itself is very complicated. So you kind of draw tangent lines all over the place and deal with the tangent lines instead of the function directly. Um, so that's kind of all we want to cover for linear approximation in this class. Um, let's move on to marginal analysis. So that's the next topic in this chapter, in this section of the chapter. And it, it's, it's the same principle. You're using your, an approximation for something. But you can use it in a different context. So we're going to use a marginal analysis. Okay, so that's on the handout that I gave you guys. Um, so in short, a marginal function is just another name for the derivative. You can think of it as a synonym as well. So if f of x is a function, f prime of x is called the marginal function. Right? It, it have, it, it's not everyone who would call that in some contexts. Usually it's in the, an economics context. Right? So like economics. Right, so if an if economist is talking about a marginal function and you talk here and talk, oh, the marginal function, blah, 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 they're really talking about derivatives. Right? So that's just a name. So for example, if C of X is, let's say you have a function that measure your cost, then that means C prime of X is what you would call your marginal cost. So that's just a little bit of vocabulary. So marginal is just another name for the derivative. Now why that name? I'm not completely sure what the etymology is, but it's, it's sort of a function that you can describe what's happening on the margins in some sense. Right? So, let me sort of introduce that idea. Why is this useful? How is the derivative useful in this context? And we go back to the definition of the derivative. The question is, how is this useful in economics? It kind of tells you what's happening at the margins, so you kind of know if you want to keep ramping up production or whatever you're doing, or you want to kind of halt. So the marginal function, the derivative function, can be uh, a predictor of what's to come. In the, in the following sense. Um, by definition, if I wanted to compute the derivative of C, just the limit as h approaches 0 of c of x plus h minus c of x all over h. So the idea is the following. This is the limit as h approaches 0, so we know that if h is small, let's say it's getting really close to 0, small is of course a relative term here, if h is super small, then what that means is that the derivative function will be roughly equal to this expression. Where small is relative. Right? Remember the limit, we don't actually care about being at zero. In fact, we can't plug in zero. We just get talk about getting super close to zero. So let's assume h is close to zero. Then the derivative is approximately this. And on top of that, suppose x is large enough so that h equals 1 can be considered small.
So let's say my C of X is the cost of producing iPhone X's in 2017. Then X is a super large number, right? So you're assuming your X is in the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or something like that. It's so huge that the number one is obviously small and probably the number one would be as small as you can get. You can't make half an iPhone. You have to have at least one iPhone. That's the, pretty much the smallest <coughs> number you can get, the closest to zero you can get. So in some context, H equals one might be considered small. And so this would mean, in this case, your C prime of X would be approximately equal to, plug in H equals one. And you end up with that expression. Now here's, so that's sort of the idea behind this. So we take our Q from the derivative, we get this expression. Pretend you're, we're dealing with context where the X is large, right? So this is like the production of some large factory where X is counting the number of products or something similar. What is the right side? How can you explain that in, in say, words? So let's say c of x plus 1 is a, a cost function. What would this expression tell you? c of x plus 1 minus c of x. So say c of x equals cost of producing X items, right? So we have, we're producing tens of thousands of items. How can I interpret this mathematical expression? Yeah? The cost of producing one more item is, is what you subtract. This means that C of X plus 1 minus C of X, <laughs> that's the cost of producing one more item. been produced. That's it. This is the cost of an additional item. Right? So what this expression is telling me, if I already produced a million <coughs> iPhones, how much would it cost me to produce a million and one iPhones? That's sort of the expression. Right? <coughs> now, if you're in business, for example, you're always sort of trying to manage your profit and your, your revenue and your costs, right? Because if the cost gets out of hand, you're starting to lose money, right? So this is sort of to, to sort of predict at what point would the cost kind of get out of hand. Okay, if we imagine this is the current situation, what would happen if we kind of pass that a little bit? Is that good or is that bad, right? This is the kind of expression you would examine, but it turns out that kind of expression is pretty much the same as the derivative. So instead of actually going through and calculating costs and doing anything complicated with the function itself, and for a very large company, a cost function might be very complicated to come about, um, you can sort of use the derivative, which tends to be simpler. So we can actually use the derivative to sort of be an approximation for the cost of producing one more item. Right? So at the margins, at the outer edges, after we've extended ourselves to x, to push that envelope a little bit, what what would that look like for us? You can actually use the derivative to sit, talk about that. So H is the additional item. Yeah, the one here is representing the additional item. So this is the cost of producing X items. This is the cost of producing X plus one items, and you're finding the difference between the two. This is sort of written on that handout anyway, but I thought I'd, I'd, ex I'd explain it again on the board. But that's sort of the interpretation. So not only can the derivative kind of help us approximate functions, but they can kind of help us to talk about what happens on the margins of some function. So if I know my function is measuring something, I can talk about 
what if we do one more of this? Is that good? Is that bad? <coughs> it can help us talk about that. So, and, and by the way, again, the marginal can refer to any function. So we can talk about our revenue function. Our, and if we take the derivative of that, that's our marginal revenue and all that. So that's all here. So the main functions in this sort of context is like cost, revenue, profit, things of that sort. Right? And we can talk about the marginal functions. It's talking about what's the situation going to be if we produce one more. It turns out the derivative can help us with that. So let's actually jump into some examples and talk about this. So let's do an example. Let's work through example one from the handout. So here's our, our question. Suppose the cause of producing X in the dark boxer shorts is that function. So we're given C of X is equal to this guy. All right, forget the units if it's thousands of dollars or just in dollars or it's in yen or whatever. That would be the function. So if I wanted to know how much would it cost me to produce one pair of boxer shorts, just plug in x equals one, it will cost me five units of currency. Okay. How much would it cost me to make two of these guys? Then I plug in two here. Okay. And so that would be eight plus six. Now my costs jump up to 14. Right. So that's an example. So to produce the first one would have cost me five. To produce two actually cost me 14. So my <laughs> costs are actually growing here the more I produce. So um, A. So A is actually an additional <coughs> cost. go from x equals 10 to x equals 11. So let's say at the moment we've already produced 10 of these boxer shorts. How much would it cost us to produce one more boxer shorts? So what is that going to be? So here you have to be very careful about how the, the question is phrased. I didn't ask you to approximate what that, that difference is. I asked you to find the additional cost. Okay. So I, I wouldn't use a derivative just yet. Right? You use a derivative when you want to approximate this sort of value. I want you to find the actual value. Because <laughs> so um, I want you to compare that. You, yeah. um, uh, you plug in 10 and 11, and then you subtract them from the other. Yeah, so I'm going to plug in 11 here. minus uh, plug in 10. So this was the cost I incurred to create 11. Cost to make 11. Here, this is my cost to make 10. And so the additional cost to go from making 10 to making 11, this expression is my additional cost. What does that equal to here? 45. It ends up being 45? Yeah. Some expensive boxer shorts. So if I created, if I already manufactured 10 of these guys, to manufacture one more would cost me 45 more dollars. <coughs> so at B. What is the marginal cost when x equals 10? Now you find the derivative and plug in 10. Right, so we have c prime of x, and this case would be what? 4x plus 3. 4x plus 3. This would mean that c prime of 10 
43. So using the derivative, I would have guessed the answer is 43. The actual answer is 45. Right? And by the way, our x values aren't even large here. Right? So this is like an error of, of 4% or something like that. It's not a huge error. And we're not even having large x values here. So this kind of shows you. If, if, this, if our x values were like in the thousands, this, the difference between these two answers would be even closer. So this is the actual computation versus the approximate computation based on the derivative. You can also note here that the calculation I had to do to find the actual answer compared to the calculation I had to do for the derivative, compare them. It was a lot easier computationally to work with the derivative. Right? And you can imagine for very complicated functions, this actually even just compounds on itself. So instead of coming up with two complicated functions and then doing a subtraction, it's much easier to work with one simpler function and do one calculation and not have to do any subtractions. Right, so this is just a comparison I want you guys to do. Let's move on to example two. This one is a little bit more involved. Do you have any questions on this? So the additional cost is you just find the difference between producing this much and this much. But you, the marginal cost would be 43, but that is just an approximation of this. So if you had to guess, your guess would be this using calculus. The actual answer was that. That might be good enough. There's, there's always errors in some things. With business, though, aren't things like supposed to be cheaper when you make more. That's why you produce a Yeah, in business, a lot of things are supposed to happen, but they don't. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, if everything happened as it's supposed to, you wouldn't have bankruptcy or a lot of things. Sometimes you, you never know. Sometimes you have a business idea, it just doesn't work out. Right? You would expect things to get cheaper, but sometimes it doesn't. And that's why using models can help you. Right? You want to kind of predict. Is the course of action that I just set in motion, is it more likely to work out okay or not work out okay? And math is one of the best tools you can use to examine that fact. You kind of um, want to predict. Um, usually it's not just Calc 1, the world's too complicated for just Calc 1. I'm just showing you Calc 1 because we're in Calc 1. But it's usually a, like a mixture of probability, statistics, and you looking at the company's fundamentals and all these things being put together, you create a whole model around that system. It'll involve calculus at some point, um, but yeah, sometimes you, you don't know, right? So it turns out that the glow-in-the-dark boxer shorts was a bad business idea. This one happens to be, it just, it's just not work. It's like the more I sell, the more it costs me. Like it's not, how much are you selling these boxer shorts for? Like, when is it going to be worth it to produce for you? Anyway, that was, okay. Move on to examples. A little bit more involved. So I just wanted you to get used to the idea from example one. Here we're told about a demand function. Do you guys know what a demand function is? Do you all understand what a demand function is? I don't think your, your book probably talks about these functions very much, so uh, I guess I'll any of you are, are doing economics, things like demand functions and supply functions you'll hear about all the time. So a demand function describes how much consumers are willing to pay. Right? That P sort of stands for price, right? If this is going to be the price. That's what a demand function tells you. So this is the price that a consumer is willing to pay. Um, and we can have 
I don't think I, I put this in the examples, but a supply function describes the cost at which suppliers are willing to produce. So usually the, the, the kind of uh, pictures that you would see <laughs> would be something like this. If your price is plotted on the horizontal, and you can talk about number of items on the vertical, a demand, a demand function will always be a decreasing function. Because think about it, the higher the price, the less people are willing to buy it. Right? People buy more Toyotas than Ferraris because as the price increases, the number of items you can, that the public will demand will decrease. Supply functions actually go the other way. Turns out the higher the price is, the more willing a supplier would be to produce the price. So it's like, okay, you're going to pay me $10 to produce one of these per item, but you'll pay me $100 to produce five of these. I'll rather produce five. You know, so the higher a price is, the more a, pr a producer is willing to produce, right? So there's this nice sweet spot here which you try to target. That's called the market equilibrium. And so to get to that point, it's kind of a lot of statistics. You, you kind of track it. Okay, if we keep nudging the price, are people buying more or less? Okay, keep pushing it more. Oh, sales are still good? Keep pushing the price more. Eventually things go, okay, let's back up, back up, back up, back up. Back. Right, so there's this whole, like, there's a whole bunch of problems and statistics happening here. So this kind of function comes from you actually doing market research, actually tracking things and keeping track of your data. So suppose you are now in a situation where you're confident that this demand function is modeled by that. Right? So if you want to know, if we're producing 100 items, how much are customers willing to pay? Well, you plug in 100 here, that would give you 10, 2.5, means $2.50 would be how much customers would be willing to pay if with our current production scheme, we can produce 100. Okay, so that's your demand. So this, think of this as the price you're willing to pay. Price you will gain. By selling X items. Right, so what price can we charge for selling X items? The demand function tells us that. If I talk about demand functions, I'm talking about the price that you can charge for my. So I really get the idea of like it's 12 dollars for a small. That is actually um, more due to psychology. That's a psychological thing, actually. Yeah, those one cent. Changes that it's it's like it's more of the same. In fact, that that actually works. It can work to your advantage as a consumer too. It, it kind of tells you when you're haggling <coughs> to not use round numbers and to kind of use smaller increments. So you wanna you wanna try to buy a car for cheap? Don't say I'll give you fifteen thousand. Say I'll go fourteen two fifty. <laughs> you know, you, and that psychologically it actually works out. So there's, there's more to the picture than just the math. There's all these statistics and psychology. There's a lot that goes into it. But we're, we're simplifying things. We're only in Calc 1. Um, so demand function. So this will be the price that you can, you can demand by selling X items. Okay, so that's our demand function. So now what's the question? So uh, here, find, so that's A, find the marginal revenue. <coughs> so 
So this is going to take a little bit of work. Um, we can have a general formula out of this, but it'll take, I, didn't, I probably didn't give you the formula yet. So if you know how much price you can charge for an item, how can you figure out how much revenue you will make? So first we need to figure out the revenue. Is that the derivative at a certain x value? Uh, you're talking about the marginal revenue? Mm, yes. Yeah, the marginal revenue is a derivative, but I'm talking about what was the what would be the original revenue function. So we're sort of going back to the ideas from Javon's hot dogs. Like, how do you figure out the revenue? The price times how many you sell. The price times how many you sell. So give me a formula for this one. Px. Px, right? Or they usually say x times p. So if you tell me how much, what the price I can charge, multiply by the number of items I'm selling, that gives me the total amount of money I make, right? So that's my revenue function, right? So this is number of items sold times price per item. So this is how much money you make when, if you're ignoring all the costs and all that stuff that goes into it. This is just purely how much money is in your cash register at the end of the day. This is called the revenue. So in other words, that means what is my revenue function here? Is it 2.5 times 100? And if we're going to be? What do you mean times 100? Why are you plugging 100? Um, I might be getting confused because I'm reading B, so I'm like... You're doing what? You're in part B. We're in part A. <laughs> like, we're not plugging in 100. I asked you to find a general formula for this. So I want you to find the marginal revenue in general. We're still in part A. We only care about 100 items in part B. Just move B to the other side. X times 25. So just plug that in, it'll be x times 25 over radical x. All right, so if I know the price, just multiply it by x, that gives me the revenue. Or in other words, that becomes 25 radical x. So this means, what is my marginal revenue? times 1 over 2 radical x. So that's my marginal revenue. In other words, one way I can interpret this is if I know the revenue I made by selling x of these items, how much revenue will I make by selling one more? What's the additional revenue that will come? Did I ask you to interpret it, or? In the next part. In the next part, in part B, I asked you to interpret it. Okay, so this is part A. So that's, in general, my revenue function. So if you know the price you're charging, which is always given by the demand function, the revenue is just going to be x times that price function. So this is our revenue function. If I want to find marginal revenue, that's the function. So now B adds about, what is the marginal revenue when x equals? 100. Just plug in 100, right? So this, just, this is just our prime of 100. So this would be 25 over 2 times radical of 100. <coughs> So that says 25 over 20. What does that simplify to? 1.25. Interpret that number. So you did this calculation. You know your revenue function. You found its derivative. You plugged in 100. The answer you got is 1.25. What does that number mean? Yeah? Um, the increase in revenue. Um, at, um, uh, let's start with the additional revenue mm -hmm. 
games. Oh, um, when a hundred items are made? Or sold? Okay. Almost, when a hundred and one items are sold. Right, so R of 100 tells me the revenue at 100. The marginal tells me how much do I gain by doing one more. That's what the marginal approximates. So let's say, assume that I produce and sold 100, how much money would I make extra by selling one more item? So in other words, to, to sell the 101st item, Now it's hard to tell whether that's worth it or not without any cost um, analysis. So revenue is just how much money we're making, but we don't know how much it's costing. So let's say in C we're given a cost function. By the way, there is no nice formula for cost. For revenue there's a nice formula, you just take X times the demand function. Costs are more complicated. Costs you do by, you have to know your own bills, whether you're contracting work or you're hiring employees or what. It depends on how your business structure is set up. So that's sort of something that you do by just statistics and record keeping and accounting and stuff like that. This function will come into being. There's no general formula for cost. Um, yeah. So let's say we're still in the same scenario. We know that our price that we can charge is 25 over radical x. And the cost, it happens to be this function. Um, what is the marginal profit? Yeah. Okay, so now we have to figure out a formula for that. Right? Which, I mean, by the time you get to the next test, you'll, have, you'll know all the formulas for these. But I just want us to reason through them again. Um, so how do we go about finding profit? How can you, as an idea, what, what do you think of profit? It's the revenue minus cost, right? It's the amount of money you make after you've paid your debts. Right, so this is how much money you're making, but if you have to pay in order to make that money, um, that's your cost. And the profit is the end of the day, the difference between your revenue minus cost. Of course, you want that number to be a positive number. You want to make money at the end of the day. You want your cost to be less than your revenue. Hopefully much less than your revenue. Okay, but that's in general what your revenue minus cost is. So in other words, we can say our P of X will always be R of X minus C of X. So that's one way you can think of it. Um, if you need to remind yourself what R of X is, you can do it even more. You can say this is just X <coughs> times P minus C of X. <coughs> where P is the price. X is the number of items in question. Right, so that's going to be your profit function. Your profit function. So what's our profit function here? Are we still using 100? Correct. No, you, you only use that if that was specified. So in this question, I never asked about any specific X value. So the cost function for was found to be this was the marginal profit function. So in order to find the marginal profit function, we first need to find the profit function. What's that going to be here? Uh, 25, over 25, over 25 over 2 radical x. Yeah. Um, plus, oh, minus x squared plus 2x. Minus x squared plus 2x, was that the function? Wait, isn't that 25 2 over x plus that was when we did the That's derivative, right? So oh, yeah, what did we get? 25 radical x? Yeah. Okay, so this here is revenue. This here is cost. Say okay, revenue minus cost, that's your profit function. So this means the marginal profit equals P prime. So this is 25 over 2 radical x minus 
to x minus 2. In other words, that is a function that will describe to me if I know the profit I make by selling x items, how much profit additionally would I make <coughs> by selling one more item? Right? That's what the margin will mean. At the margins, what happens if you go a little bit extra? <coughs> one more extra. Usually it's in guys, one more. <coughs> So that's part C. D. What is the marginal profit at upper term? Let me just plug X into that equation. Plug that in. This would just be P prime of 100 is be 25 over 2 radical 100 minus 2 times 100 times 2. worth producing once more, one more item? No. <laughs> no. Right? This tells you the additional profit you can expect by producing one more item after you've produced 100 items. You are losing $200 if you go one more. So that not only tells you you shouldn't produce one more, but you should have not produced probably a few more a while ago. Right, so whenever you, if you're in a situation where your marginal profit starts turning up minus 200, it means you pass the point where you should have passed like a while ago. <laughs> right, and you need to start scaling back big time. Right, so the answer is no, because marginal profit is negative. And what that means, how you interpret a negative profit, is a loss of money. That means your cost exceeds the revenue. Right? Profit less than zero means you lose money. Since that means your cost is greater than your revenue. So the amount of money you're bringing in is less than the amount of money you're bringing out. That's the only way to get a negative profit. By looking at the marginal revenue, you can, you can assume, if I'm at 100, if I produce one more, I'm, I'm actually going to be down by $200.75. What's NB? Uh, it's note. It's, uh, it's an abbreviation of a French phrase that you know. It's note that they don't know well or something like that. Question in a, in a test might look more like example two. Probably not as many parts, but something similar. So I'd want to know you know how to develop these functions. You know how to take derivatives, which I assume by that means that you will know. But do you know what the derivative means? Can you interpret the results that you just saw? But in general, let's say you, you kind of know like the functions or the data points that determine your cost. You also kind of know what will determine your revenue because you know about the de demand functions through statistics. You also know what price you're going to be charging for the item. So you can figure out your revenue and your cost. One thing you can do is set up a mathematical model that doesn't look at any of that. It looks rather at the derivative of the profit function. And then as soon as that dips to, to being negative, you know you can halt production. You can kind of use this to predict in general how much you want to push the envelope from the very beginning. So this is sort of an analysis you can do. And of course different models will have different ways of 
of suggesting this, but this is a very naive way of doing it with calc one. It's just use your derivative and it predicts how much just doing one more can be. Uh, we'll actually stop there. So. We'll do exponential growth and decay next time, so bring, remember to bring the handouts with you um, for next class. Should we bring the 3.5? Why do you like that? We finished this section. So the, the, the homework for linear approximation margin and ask whatever section that is, 3. Point whatever. That's, that's the. 3.2. That's the. Three point five was what? Implicit. Yeah, we, that I, that should be due today. Yeah. I finished that last. Week. So leave your homework for three point five and three point two is due on. Due on Tuesday. Can't wait for spring break to be here. <laughs>